have returned to the God of my childhood, to the same simple faith as a child I once knew, like the prodigal son. I longed for my loved ones, for the comforts of home, and the God I outgrew. I have returned to the God of my childhood, Bethlehem's faith, the prophet's messiah. We have been studying the issue of the deity of Jesus Christ from the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. Now, to be able to understand some things in regard to the background of historical nature in the Catholic Church, we need to look at some history itself. The difficulties in regard to the nature of Christ in Catholicism began in Alexandria, Egypt, between a bishop named Alexander and a presbyter by the name of Arius. And you may have heard the Arian doctrine before. Now, this Arian doctrine came from this particular man named Arius. I'm going to be reading from A.T. Jones's book, The Two Republics, most of the time. I'll give you the page numbers on the screen so you'll be able to see them. I won't always mention them as we are going along. And if there's something other reference material, I will mention it along the way. The first one here is Two Republics by A.T. Jones, page 332. It says here, there was no dispute about the fact of there being a Trinity. It was about the nature of the Trinity. Both parties believed in precisely the same Trinity, but they differed upon the precise relationship which the Son bears to the Father. Alexander's belief was the actual belief that eventually became defended by the Catholic Church. And from his belief came the Nicene Creed. Again, page 333, I want to read here. Now, this is the actual belief as stated by Alexander. The Son is immutable and unchangeable, all sufficient and perfect like the Father, differing only in this one respect, that the Father is unbegotten. He is the exact image of His Father. Everything is found in the image which exists in the archetype, and it was this that our Lord taught when He said, My Father is greater than I. And accordingly, we believe that the Son proceeded from the Father, for He is the reflection of the glory of the Father and the figure of His substance. But let no one be led from this to the supposition that the Son is unbegotten, as is believed by some who are deficient in intellectual power. For to say that He was, that He has always been, and that He existed before all ages, is not to say that He is unbegotten. So the original Catholic view was that Christ came out of the Father, was born, and therefore possesses the same nature of the Father. Today, we have some terminology, something similar to cloning the best that I can look at it. Now, it was Arius' belief that caused opposition in the Catholic Church. And here is what Arius was teaching, page 333. We say and believe and have taught and do teach that the Son is not unbegotten, nor in any way unbegotten, even in part, and that he does not derive his substance from any matter, but that by his own will and counsel he has subsisted before time and before ages as perfect God and only begotten and unchangeable, and that he existed not before he was begotten or created or purposed or established. 
for he was not unbegotten. We are persecuted because we say that the Son had a beginning, but that God was without beginning. This is really the cause of our persecution, and likewise because we say he is from nothing. And this we say because he is neither part of God nor any subjacent matter. For this reason we can say that Arius believed that Christ had a beginning and that he actually was created out of nothing and then after he was created out of nothing God elevated him to the same nature as God. Continuing on a little bit about the development of this controversy. From these statements by the originators of the respective sides of the controversy, it appears that with the exception of a single point, the two views were identical, only being said in different ways. So, in the conclusion here of A.T. Jones, it is that these views of Arius and Alexander were exactly the same, said a little bit differently. The single point where the difference lay was that Alexander held that the Son was begotten of the very essence of the Father and is therefore of the same substance with the Father. So the Arius view, so the Alexander's view, which became the Catholic view, was that Jesus Christ was begotten of the very essence of the Father and therefore he is the same substance of the Father. While Arius held that the Son was begotten by the Father, not from his own essence, but from nothing, but that when he was thus begotten, he was and is precisely the like substance with the Father. That is the idea of Arius. In reality, the whole issue is whether Jesus is the exact substance of the Father or a similar substance with the Father. Now, I'm going to read here from the book Truth Triumphant by Benjamin Wilkinson, page 92. We're dealing with here one particular word. One Greek word is the whole controversy, and it's homusian. And in English, the word is consubstantial, connoting that more than one person inhabit the same substance without division or separation. So that is the word that is at the root of this controversy. The original term in Greek, homusios, from Homos meaning identical and Usia being the word for being. Now this group charged the Arius party of polytheism and as an introduction of heathenistic superstitions. So they believed that Arius was introducing more than one God by Jesus being created or coming into existence separate from God. He now, we now have two gods. The word described Arius' viewpoint was homusion. It's exactly the same word except one letter is inserted, the letter I. The word comes from the Greek homos, meaning similar or like unto. Now this group charged the Catholic or Alexander's side as being blasphemers, as those who subvert the existence of the Son of God. Now keep in mind that both sides agreed on the Trinity. Arius' side believes in the same Trinity as Alexander's side. So what was the cause of all the difficulty? What was the cause of all the bloodshed that happened for the next century or so until they kind of settled this thing out? The difficulty was that each disputant required that all the others should believe not only what he believed, but that they should believe this precisely as he believed it, whereas just how he believed it, he himself could not define it. What they were trying to do is, each party was trying to convince the other to believe the exact wording. And if you cannot explain it in exact wording, then you're considered an apostate. This was in reality an attempt of the finite to measure, to analyze, and even to dissect the infinite. It was an attempt to make the human superior to the divine. God is infinite. No finite mind can comprehend him as he actually is. Christ is the word, the expression of the thought of God, and none but he knows the depths of the meaning of that word. In reality, only God understands himself to the extent that we're trying to divide him up over here. 
neither the nature nor the relationship of the Father and the Son can ever be measured by the mind of man. That is impossible. We cannot measure the mind of God by our own words. Matthew 11, verse 27, All things are delivered unto me of my Father, and no man knoweth the Son but the Father, neither knoweth any man the Father, save the Son, and he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. The revelation of the Father in this world will never be complete. We have to wait until eternity in order to be able to understand who God is, completely that is. Ephesians 2, 7 says, The exceeding riches of His grace in His kindness towards us through Jesus Christ. Therefore, no man's conception of God can ever be fixed as a conception of God. We will never be able to understand it in every little detail. But we need to understand him somewhat. There, we, we need to be able to understand God to some degree. John 17, verse 3, And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. That means we do need to understand God to some degree. The only way that we can really understand who God is is by the Holy Spirit's revelation. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 17, it says, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. God is going to reveal himself to us through the power and work of the Holy Spirit. There is no other way for us to understand him. Therefore, the only thing for men to do to find out the Almighty unto perfection is true faith in Jesus Christ, to receive the abiding presence of the spirit of revelation and then quietly and joyfully wait for the eternal ages to reveal the depth of the riches both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. So that's the only way we're going to understand it. We have to wait until eternity to understand the depths of God. We'll be studying about God forever and ever and ever. But there are things that God has revealed of himself to us and we've been studying some of those issues in the last few hours. But right now we want to go back to this history. In order to resolve this history in the church, in the so-called Christian church, the Emperor Constantine got involved. And so what he did is he called a council in 325 AD in May or June of that year in order to be able to resolve some of these issues. And this council was called in the city of Nice in Italy. And this council is composed of 318 bishops together with presbyters, deacons, and all the rest of them. This was the first so-called ecumenical council of the Catholic Church. Right after they began in this council, they quickly came to the point of making a draft copy of an agreement of something they would deal with. And this particular draft copy, it reads this way. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of all things, both visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the Word of God, God of God, light of lights, life of life, the only begotten Son, the firstborn of every creature, begotten of the Father before all worlds, by whom also all things were made, who for our salvation was made flesh and lived amongst men, and suffered and rose again on the third day, and ascended to the Father, and shall come in glory to judge the quick and the dead. And we believe in one Holy Ghost, believing each of them to be and to have existed. The Father, only the Father, and the Son, only the Son, and the Holy Ghost, only the Holy Ghost. As also our Lord, sending forth his own disciples to preach, said, Go and teach all nations, baptizing them into the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Concerning which things we affirm that it is so, and that we so think, and that it has long been so held, and that we remain steadfast to death for this faith, anatomizing every godless heresy that we have thought these things from our heart and soul from the time that we have known ourselves and that we now think and say thus in truth. We testify in the name of Almighty God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, being able to prove even by demonstration and to persuade you that in past times also thus we believed and preached. Well, immediately after this uh, proposition was made, this first draft, immediately the party of Arius agreed to it all. They saw nothing in there that they could disagree upon. But you know, the other party, the, they wanted to have control in the church and in the empire. And they knew that in order to be able to control, they not only have to have everyone agree with them, but they have to show that they have the power to, do, to control other people. So what they did, they came to add a few more things in there. And here is what they added to the original Nicene Creed. 
We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of all things, both visible and invisible. And in one Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, begotten of the Father, only begotten, that is to say, of the substance of the Father. God of God, light of lights, very God of very God. Begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, both things in heaven and things in earth, who for us men and for our salvation came down and was made flesh and was made man, suffered and rose again on the third day and went up into the heavens and has come again to judge the quick and the dead. And in the Holy Ghost, but those that say there was when he was not, and before he was begotten he was not, and that he came into existence from what was not, or who profess that the Son of God is of a different person or substance, or that he is created or changeable or variable, are anathemized by the Catholic Church. Well, that made quite a strong statement now. Now, to this, the party of Arius could not agree. And so, in that presentation, 17 bishops did not sign this particular decree. Then, Constantine used threats, political persuasions, all the different things that he could think about, and finally, four individuals did not give in. All the rest gave in, and that was almost unanimous. And these four individuals, two of them simply could not agree with the curse at the very end, and the other two actually believed it, and they refused to give up their belief. Therefore, they were then banished from their duties in the church. Continue from the book, Truth Triumphant, by Benjamin Wilkinson. The burning question of the decade succeeding the Council of Nicaea was how to state the relation of the three persons of the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. The Council had decided, and the papacy had appropriated, the decision as its own. The personalities of the Trinity were not confounded, and the substance was not divided. So this was the Nicene council that was held, the very first ecumenical council. From the SDA Bible Student Source book, page 673, thus it came to pass that out of an assembly which partook more of the character of a political convention than a religious convocation, there emerged the Nicene Creed, which to this day is the standard of orthodoxy in the Roman, Eastern, Anglican, and some other churches. So this is how they came about from it a nice, good political convention using all their intrigues that Satan can imagine. From this period, we may date the introduction of rigorous articles of belief, which required the submissive assent of the mind to every word and letter of an established creed, and which raised the slightest heresy of opinion into the more fatal offense against God and the more odious crime in the estimation of man than the worst moral delinquency of the most flagrant deviation from the spirit of Christianity. So in reality at this point in time what they began with was creeds and they established a creed, they established the exact wording and if you do not believe the exact wording that they have then you're considered a heretic. Even though the decision of the Council of Nicaea had been absolutely and from honest conviction, even if it was that way, spontaneously unanimous, suppose it was, it never could rest with the slightest degree of obligation or authority upon any soul who had not arrived at the same conclusion from honest conviction derived from the free exercise of his own power of thought. There is no organization nor tribunal on earth that has any right to decide for anybody what is the truth upon any religious question. So this particular uh, decision that was made by the council there in Nicaea, their decision could be only for themselves. Yes, it may be the, the church's position, but to condemn someone simply because they differed from it and eventually which led into persecution and, and even loss of life, for something to be truth, a person must hold it from their own heart. It's because of the conviction that they have. Convincing the mind that it is the right thing is more valuable than using anathemas. A.T. Jones continues, His assent to any form of belief or doctrine to be true must spring from his own personal conviction that such is the truth. The truth itself, said Neander, forced on man otherwise than by his own inward power becomes falsehood. If a truth 
is held because of fear. Because of fear of position. We may lose our position. We may lose our something or another. If that's what we have it for, then it becomes a falsehood in our own minds. The realm of thought is the realm of God. Whosoever would attempt to restrict or coerce the free exercise of the thought of another usurps the dominion of God and exercises that of the devil. This is what Constantine did at the Council of Nice. This is what the majority of the Council of Nice itself had done. The next part of our history we're going to find is how Arianism, which was condemned at the Council of Nice, became the actual belief of the empire. Constantine's sister died in 327 AD. Now, Constantine's sister happened to be an Arian. And through her influence, she got Constantine to remove the banishment of Arius, and he was restored to his responsibilities. Constantine, soon after her death, removed him from banishment, and after Arius signed some kind of an agreement, he was restored back to his position. In 337 AD, just before Constantine's death, would you believe it, Constantine, who was leading out in Anastasius' belief in the way the Catholic Church believes the Trinitarian belief today, that in 337 he was baptized by an Arian bishop. Afterwards, Constantine's three sons took his place. The three sons were Constantine II, who was a zealous Catholic, Constantius, who was a zealous Arian, and Constance, who was also a zealous Catholic. So these three ended up dividing the kingdom among themselves. In 340 AD, Constantine II died in the battle with his own brother. And so now that left the East and the Western divisions of the Roman Empire. The Eastern division was the Arian belief. The Western was the Anastasian belief. In 341, another council was held in Antioch consisting of 90 bishops in the presence of the Emperor Constantius. And since he was an Arian, then this council adopted a new creed from which the Homusian was omitted. After much bloodshed and various councils often directly opposed to each other, the Arian idea eventually seemed to gain the ascendancy. A joint council was then held in 345 to 346 AD. 176 bishops came together, 96 from the west and 74 from the east. When the Eastern bishops demanded that Anastasius and others who had been condemned in the East not be allowed to be in the council, the Western bishops did not agree and therefore the bishops from the East withdrew and held a rival council in Philippopolis. In these two cities sat the rival councils, each asserting itself the genuine representatives of Christendom, issuing decrees and anathemizing their adversaries. In 350 AD, Constance was murdered by Magnetius, a usurper. In 353, Constantius became the sole emperor after the final defeat of this usurper. And he determined to make Arianism the religion of the empire, and so he called another council in 353. In this council, Anastasius, the leader of the Catholic belief, was condemned. The bishop of Rome, Liberius, refused the decision of this council and called for another one. And he held that one in Milan in 355. At this council, more than 300 bishops came from the west, attended by only a few from the east. Now the emperor not only demanded that the Catholic bishops should sign the condemnation of Athanasius, he was the one that was promoting the Nicene Creed, but that they should also sign an Arian formula of faith. At last, by the inspiration of flatteries, persuasions, bribes, menaces, penalties, exiles, the Council of Milan was brought to a greater unanimity of the faith than even the Council of Nice had been. And of course, if any council would be of worth anything, it would be this one since it was more unanimous than all the others. 
Now, since the Bishop of Rome did not agree with this, he was banished for several years until finally he signed the decision of the Council of Milan that condemned Athanasius and established the Arian Creed of Milan. As time went on, the emperor began to change his views. And from being an Arian, he became a semi-Arian. And so at this time, we can find that there was actually three beliefs going on in the empire. The Anastasians declare that the Son of God to be the, the same substance, the same existence, and the same essence with the Father when he was begotten. This is the doctrine of the Council of Nice. The strict Arians declared that the Son to be like the Father, but rather by grace than by nature, as like as a creature could be to the Creator. This is the doctrine of the Council of Milan. The semi-Arians declared the Son to be like the Father in nature, in existence, in essence, in substance, and in everything else. This new doctrine was held by Constantius and a company that actually outnumbered the Arians. So in the summer of 359, a council was held in Rimi for the Western bishops and in Seleucia for the Eastern bishops. The emperor sent the following to be adapted. We believe in one only true God, the Father and ruler of all, creator and demiurge of all things, and in one only begotten Son of God, who was begotten of the Father without change before all ages and all beginnings and all conceivable time and all comprehensible substance. God from God, similar to the Father, who has begotten him according to the Holy Scriptures, whose generation no one knows or understands but the Father who has begotten him. The word Uzia, because it was used by the fathers in simplicity, that is, with good intention, but not being understood by the people, occasion, scandal, and is not contained in the Scriptures, shall be put aside, and in future no mention shall be made of the Uza with regard to God. But we maintain the Son is similar to the Father in all things, as also the Holy Scriptures teach us. So this emperor now sent that decree to be signed by the people. At first, the council Rimni rejected this pronouncement and pronounced a curse upon the Arians. This was rejected by the emperor and he gathered them together until they, all but 20, came over to the Arian party. And uh, these 20 came together with the leaders of the empire and began to reconstruct the creed. First were inserted some curses against the Arian heresy, then an addition declaring the son to be equal to the father without beginning and before all things. When this was written, Valens proposed that in order to leave no room whatever for any new disputes or any questions upon the point, there should be added a clause declaring that the Son of God is not a creature like other creatures. To this the twenty bishops ascended blindly overlooking the fact that in admitting that the Son was not a creature like other creatures, they indeed placed him among the creatures and admit the very point upon which the Arians had all the time insisted. Thus all were brought to the unity of the faith the council broke up and the bishops departed to their homes. Now this is real tragedy when we look at Christendom. Instead of seeing the word of God to understand answers, it was nothing but political movements to gain power with the government. Now the other council that was held in Seleucia, Constantine spent the whole day and the greater part of the night of December 31st, 359, in securing the signatures of the confession of faith which he had approved, and finally published a decree under the penalty of exile to all who refused the decree. So at that point, then all the seas were now filled by Arians. Almost completely everyone was an Arian in the east and in the west. After the death of Constantius, both the emperors that succeeded him, first Julian and then Jovian, gave a tolerance to religious liberty both to Catholics and Arians. Then Valentinian was chosen as emperor in 364 and 30 days later bestowed an equal share in the government to his brother Valens. Together they still gave religious tolerance to the two parties in the Catholic Church, both to the Arians and to the Athanasians. But they did something. They did start a persecution. They said they loosed a cruel persecution upon those who professed magic. And you wouldn't believe it. Everyone who didn't like the other party began to accuse them of, guess what? Magic. 
and therefore persecution started all over again. In 370, Valens was baptized at the hands of the Arian Bishop of Constantinople, and the old quarrels began again in order to gain influence. Keep in mind that none of these quarrels would have had any weight except for the fact that church and state were being mixed in it. In the West, after the death of Constantius, the bishops returned to the faith established by the Council of Nice which so largely prevailed there that the differences springing up from the Arian side caused no material difficulty. In 375, Valentinian died and was succeeded by his two sons, Gratian and Valentinian II. In 378, Valens was killed in a battle with the Goths and Gratian chose Theodosius as associate emperor. In 380, he was baptized by a Catholic bishop of Thessalonica and immediately issued the following edict. He wrote, it is our pleasure that the nations which are governed by our clemency and moderation should steadfastly adhere to the religion which was taught by St. Peter to the Romans, which faithful tradition has preserved and which is now professed by the Pontiff Damasius and by Peter, Bishop of Alexandria, a man of apostolic holiness. According to the discipline of the apostles and the doctrine of the gospel, let us believe the sole deity of the Father, the Son and the Holy Ghost under an equal majesty and pious trinity. We authorize the followers of this doctrine to assume the title of Catholic Christians. And as we judge that all others are extravagant madmen, we brand them with the infamous name of heretics and declare that their conventicles shall not longer usurp the respectable appellation of churches. Besides the condemnation of divine justice, they must expect to suffer the severe penalties which our authority, guided by heavenly wisdom, shall think proper to inflict upon them. This decree was signed by the three emperors, Gratian, Valentinian II, and Theodosius. At the beginning of the year 381, Theodosius issued an edict expelling from all the churches within his dominions all the bishops and other ecclesiastics who should refuse to subscribe to the Council of Nice. Then a general council then again was held in Constantinople in 381. We decided the following about the nature of Christ. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of the Father before all times or ages, light from light, very God from very God, begotten, not created, of the same substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Ghost of the Virgin Mary and was made man, who was crucified for us under Pontius Pilate, suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven and sat down at the right hand of the Father. And he shall come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And we believe in the Holy Ghost, the Lord and life giver, who proceeded from the Father, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spake by the prophets, and in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Isn't this really confusing? All these people coming up with decrees instead of Bible doctrines that are simple and we can evaluate them. And even if we differ upon some doctrinal belief, we should be able to sit down and study upon them from the Word of God instead of condemning somebody out of the kingdom. After they had finished the council, they wrote a letter to Theodosius. In obedience to your letters, we met together at Constantinople, and having first restored union among ourselves, we then made short definitions confirming the faith of the fathers of Nicaea and condemning the heresies which have risen in opposition to it. Council after council followed to establish the faith. The boasted unity of Romanism was gloriously displayed by the diversified councils and confessions of the fourth century. Popery on that as on every other occasion eclipsed Protestantism in the manufacture of creeds. Forty-five councils, says Jordan, were held in the fourth century. Forty-five councils in a hundred years. That means a council every almost two years to try to figure out what they believed. Of these, 13 were against Arianism, 15 were for that heresy, and 17 for semi-Arianism. The roads were crowded with bishops thronging to the synods, and the traveling expenses which were defrayed by the emperor exhausted the public funds. No wonder they wanted to go to these councils. They billed it all to the emperor. All their traveling costs were paid by the emperor in order to try to find some kind of unity in the Christian church. 
These exhibitions became the sneer of the heathen who were amused to behold men who from infancy had been educated in Christianity and appointed to instruct others in that religion hastened in this matter to distant places and conventions for the purpose of ascertaining their beliefs. I don't need to go to a convention to figure out what I believe. The purpose of going to conferences like a general conference session to understand our belief is to come to a reasonable understanding of what we believe as a whole. And then I have to study for myself before I submit to somebody's beliefs. We do not have a creed. The Catholic Church here was teaching a creed and they got more confused by the time they got finished. In the space of 15 years, he, Theodosius, promulgated at least 15 severe edicts against the heretics, more especially against those who rejected the doctrine of the Trinity. In these edicts, it was enacted that any of the heretics who should usurp the title of bishop or presbyter should suffer the penalty of exile and confiscation of goods if they attempted either to preach the doctrine or practice the rites of their accursed sects. That these laws might not be in vain, the office of the inquisitor of the faith was instituted and it was not long before capital punishment was inflicted upon heresy though not exactly under Theodosius himself. Thus the union of the church and state, the clothing of the church with civil power bore its inevitable fruit and that is persecution. Whenever church and state unite, persecution is the only thing that can take place. In reestablishing the unity of the Catholic Church, Theodosius did not confine his attention to professors of Christianity alone. In his original edict, it was to be remembered that all his subjects should be Catholic Christians. A good many of his subjects were pagans and still conformed to the pagan ceremonies and worships. Later on, he brought the Senate of Rome to the same conclusion, using intrigue the same way as he did at the other councils to bring them up to one belief. Now I want to address a little bit the modern Catholic view. We were talking about the initial development of the Catholic doctrines. And you will remember that in those Catholic doctrines they believe that Jesus Christ was born or was begotten from God in eternity in the past somewhere back there. And that he had proceeded from God somehow out of the same substance of the Father. And because he is the same substance, they can call him eternal God. Now, the modern Catholic view, I'm going to be reading from the Creed, the Summary of the Faith. It's a chapter entitled, The Unity and Trinity of God. This is by Leo J. Tress and published Dome Books and copyrighted 1963, Notre Dame, Indiana. And here is how he explains the modern viewpoint. And I will show you it's not only modern, it actually goes back a little bit longer than modern times. On page 43, theologians do, of course, cast some light upon the mystery for us. They explain that the distinction between the three persons in God is based upon the relationship that exists between these three persons. There is God the Father, who looks into his divine mind and sees himself as he really is, and forms a thought about himself. You and I do the same thing often. We turn our gaze inward and see ourselves and form a thought about ourselves. It is a thought which expresses itself in the silent words, John Smith or Mary Jones. But with God, things are very different. It is of the very nature of God to exist. There is no other way of thinking straight about God except to think of Him as the being who never had a beginning, the being who always was and always will be. The only real definition we can give of God is to say, He is who is. That is the way you'll remember that God described Himself to Moses, I am who am. If the thought that God has of himself then is to be an infinitely complete and perfect thought, it must include existence. Since to exist is of the very nature of God, the image that God sees of himself, the silent word that he eternally speaks of himself, must have a distinct existence of its own. It is this living thought which God has of himself, the living word in which he perfectly expresses himself, whom we call God the Son. God the Father is God knowing himself. God the Son is the expression of God's knowledge of Himself. Thus, the second person of the Blessed Trinity is called the Son precisely because from all eternity He is generated, He is begotten in the divine mind of the Father. Did you notice this? The Catholic viewpoint is that Jesus Christ was generated in the mind of the Father in eternity in the past. 
Now God the Father, God knowing himself, and God the Son, God knowledge of himself, contemplate the divine nature which they possess in common. As they gaze, we speak of course in human terms, they behold that in that nature all that is beautiful and good, all in short that commands love to an infinite degree. And so the divine will moves in an act of infinite love for the divine goodness and beauty. Since God's love for himself, like God's knowledge of himself, is of the very nature of God, it must be a living love. This infinitely perfect, infinitely intense living love which flows eternally from the Father and the Son is He whom we call the Holy Ghost, proceeding from the Father and the Son. He is the third person of the Blessed Trinity. God the Father is God knowing Himself. God the Son is the expression of God's knowledge of Himself. God the Holy Spirit is the result of God's love for Himself. This is the Blessed Trinity, three divine persons in one God, one divine nature. So now, after hearing all this of the explanation of the doctrine of the Catholic Church, this person now gives an illustration on how we can understand it in practical terms. Suppose you look at yourself in a full-length mirror. You see there an image of yourself that is perfect, except for one thing. It is not a living image. It is just a reflection in the glass. But if that image were to step out of the mirror and stand beside you, living and breathing like yourself, then it would be a perfect image indeed. There would not be two of you. There would be just one you, one human nature. There would be two persons, but only one mind and one will, sharing the same knowledge and the same thought. So keep in mind here, he says, if you're looking at an image in a mirror, you see an image there, right? And that image, just imagine if that image would now step out of the mirror. And now there are two of you. Two, two persons, only one mind, only one nature, but two persons. Then since self-love, the right kind of self-love is natural to an intelligent being, they would flow between you and your image and ardent love, one for the other. Now give your fancy free reign and think of this love as being so much a part of yourself, so deeply rooted in your very nature as to be a living, breathing reproduction of yourself. This love would be the third person. Still only one you, remember, only one human nature the third person standing between you and your image, the three of you linked hand in hand, three persons, one human nature. So here it is, that image stepped out of the mirror, and you're looking at that image, and now you love that image, you love yourself, and then that love is a being, that love is what they call the Holy Spirit. One error we must guard against in our thinking about the Blessed Trinity. We must not think of God the Father as having come first, and God the Son a little later, and God the Holy Ghost still later. All three are equally eternal, possessing as they do the one divine nature. So here, they're trying to describe that as one nature. All three are equally eternal, possessing as they do the one divine nature. God's thought and God's love are equally timeless with God's nature. And God the Son and God the Holy Spirit are not in any way subordinate to God the Father. One is not more powerful, nor wiser, nor greater than the other. All three possess the same infinite perfection and equally rooted in the one divine nature which they equally possess. So in reality, Catholicism believes that there's only one mind, one being called God. And that God manifests itself in three different ways. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And all of them are controlled by one nature. However, we do attribute to the individual divine person certain works certain activities that seem most suitable to the particular relationship of this or that divine person. For example, it is God the Father that we attribute the work of creation. Since we think of Him as the generator, the instigator, the starter of things, the seat of the infinite power which God possesses. So, in Catholicism, God the Father is the creator. Similarly, since God the Son is the knowledge or wisdom of the Father, we ascribe to Him the works of wisdom. It was He who came upon earth to make truth known to us and to heal the breach between God and man. And finally, since the Holy Ghost is infinite love, we appropriate to Him the works of love, particularly the sanctification of souls, since sanctification results from the indwelling of God's love within the soul. And in summary, he can say, God the Father is the Creator, God the Son is the Redeemer, God the Holy Spirit is the Sanctifier, and yet what one does, all do, where one is, all are. That is the su summary of the Catholic viewpoint today, at least 1963. Now, when we talk about Trinitarianism, this Catholic idea of Trinitarianism is what we oppose. 
When we were studying about three persons in the Godhead in our last studies, we saw clearly that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are eternal in nature. They have always been. They are three persons in the Godhead. We saw, as the Spirit of Prophecy calls it, three separate distinct beings. She calls them the heavenly trio. And these three beings are one in the same way that we as a church are one. We may have 30 people in the church, but we are to be one, not one being, not one nature, well, not one man, but one in purpose. And that is how the heavenly trio work, the Godhead. Now someone some time ago told me that this is not the Catholic view for centuries. This may be something new. In reality, I found an article in the Catholic Encyclopedia explaining that Thomas Aquinas explained the Catholic doctrine which has been standard doctrine ever since he wrote it. And he wrote it back, if I'm not mistaken, it was around 1200 A.D. I want to read to you something from St. Thomas Aquinas' catechism about the deity. It's in a section entitled Divine Generation. It must be known that different things have different modes of generation. The generation of God is different from that of other things. Hence, we cannot arrive at a notion of divine generation except to the generation of that created thing which more closely approaches to the likeness of God. We have seen that nothing approaches in likeness to God more than the human soul. The manner of generation in the soul is affected in the thinking process in the soul of man, which is called conceiving of the intellect. This conception takes its rise in the soul as from a father, and its effect is called the word of the intellect of the man. In brief, the soul by its act of thinking begets the word. So also the Son of God is the word of God, not like a word that is uttered exteriorly, for this is transitory, but as a word is interiorly conceived, and this word of God is of one nature as God and equal to God. But a word in us is not the same as the word in God. In us, a word is an accident, whereas in God, the word is the same as God. Since there is nothing in God that is not of the essence of God, no one would say God has not a word, because such would make God holy without knowledge. And therefore, as God always exists, so also did his word ever exist. Just as a sculpture works from a form which he has previously thought out, which is his word, so also God makes all things by his word, as it were through his art. All things were made by him. A little bit further down it says, Among the different comparisons brought forth to show the mode and manner of this eternal generation, that which is taken from the production of thought in our mind seems to come nearest to its illustration, and hence St. John calls the Son the Word. For our mind understands itself in the same way, forms an image of itself which theologians have called the Word. So God, insofar as we may compare human things to divine, understands himself, begets the eternal Word. In reality, when you look at St. Thomas Aquinas' catechism, it is the same thing as what Catholicism teaches today. Their view is that the Word of God was generated in eternity in the past by God. And because He is of the same substance as God, He is God. That is Catholicism. The truth in the Word of God is that Jesus Christ always was. There never was a time that He was not. He is the one that was the Creator. He is the one that came into this world and became a man. And may the Lord help us that as we study this history, we only spent a very brief time on history because we want to spend most of our time on the Word of God to learn what God teaches. If Catholicism adopted the truth, we would accept the truth because they believe something doesn't make it wrong. The fact that anybody believes something doesn't make it wrong. But we need to know for ourselves on a thus saith the Lord. And may the Lord help you that you also may search the Scriptures to know for yourself what is a thus saith the Lord, and hold on to that. I have returned that of my mother. I learned and learned. He's the lily of the valley. He's Jesus too.
Turn. 